everyone today we are going to be streaking a urine culture and also performing a colony count after 24 hours incubation so the purpose for this is to try to figure out uh, how many bacteria and what type of bacteria are in a patient's specimen and that's clinically significant because it could indicate a urinary tract infection and that um, depends on a whole lot of factors including how many colony forming units there are and so when we are going to be inoculating a urine culture, we'll be using a different loop than we're used to seeing. So as you see on the back, it says that yellow loops are a 10 microliter volume, whereas a blue loop is a one microliter volume. When we count colony forming fact units, sorry, co colony forming units, we are taking into account the dilution factor of the specimen itself and how much we actually introduced onto the plate. So noting that the blue, it's with is, which is what we're using, is a one microliter volume, we will multiply however many colonies that form on the blood auger plate, we'll multiply that by a thousand to figure out how many bacterial cells are within a one milliliter volume. Okay, and that is how a colony forming unit is calculated. So we're going to go ahead and get started opening up the bag, shaking out one. Okay, we've got the blood auger plate because that should grow everybody uh, that could possibly be present in a urine. And uh, so it's basically like a nutrient auger. And then we have the McConkey auger plate, which is to to grow those GNRs and most of the time you'll find that the urinary tract infections are from the GNRs from the Enterobacteraceae family but that is not always the case and uh, so the growth on both of these would indicate a lot of different scenarios. One of them could be that the patient's sample was contaminated because it was not collected in a clean catch manner where the area was cleansed and uh, excess skin is held back the patient would urinate and then stick the cup in to the urine stream after it started and then to uh, finish voiding and send the specimen to the laboratory but that is not always what happens so what you'll end up seeing and which we've discussed in other videos is you'll end up seeing like three or four different kinds of organisms growing on this blood auger plate and that would show normal flora contamination so there's a lot of scenarios that could happen but uh, we'll we'll just do one today so first we swirl Make sure we mix that specimen really well. Okay, and then we're gonna go ahead, dip our loop. Okay, make sure we get some in there. We're going to do a line down the center of the blood auger plate and a line down the center of our McConkey plate. You can see that I didn't really get too much there, so um, you could instead have dipped it before you put it on the McConkie plate there. Okay. Close this up. And then you can get another one. And what we're going to do is try to spread all the bacteria from this uh, line that was introduced we're going to spread it across the entire plate. So we're doing a streaking um, pattern where we're going in a horizontal line across that vertical line. Well, it would be vertical this way. Okay, so see how they're nice and tightly packed in there. All right, then we're turning 90 degrees and we're going to go parallel to that original line that we did when we introduced the specimen. Okay, the reason we're doing this is because we want to spread out the bacteria all over the plate if they are present. So that way we can then count those colonies that form. All right, keeping the same loop, I can now go 
to the McConkey auger plate and do the same thing. You don't want to go from, you don't want to use the same loop from a McConkey to a blood auger plate because there are uh, inhibiting components in this auger that would cause bacteria possibly not to grow on the blood auger plate. Okay, and so we would be cross-contaminating those components. That is why we do the, excuse me, the blood chocolate McConkie streaking order. And the same thing when you go to any other um, order of plating, like the anaerobic setup. There's always an order with the most inhibitory component uh, auger being the last one towards the end. Okay, so here I would then end up putting these into a, um, sorry, a media holder and put them in the incubator, um, the CO2 incubator for a day, so 24 hours. Um, you may choose to also end up doing a 48 hour after that, after checking them. So these have been incubated in that CO2 incubator for a day, so 24 hours, and it is that patient. And we're gonna go ahead and check what we find. Okay, so remember, everything uh, should be growing on the, the blood auger plate and only the GNR should be growing here. So as we said, not um, all bacteria that cause a urinary tract infection, there's also yeast that could do that as well, but not all the organisms that cause a urinary tract infection would be a GNR. Um, so this one looks like there is a GNR in that urine because it did grow on the McConkie auger plate. And it looks like it's a non-lactose fermenter, okay? Looking at the blood auger plate, wow. <laughs> we see that there are a lot of colonies there. In fact, not all of them are distinct. So essentially this is too numerous to count. So this means that we, um, we have what looks like a clinically significant bacteria here. It does look like it's the same organism that is on this McConkie auger plate. Okay, so we're um, thinking that this is a GNR. It could be from the family Enterobacteraceae because we do know that they are very, very common um, um, as pathogens for urinary tract infection. Um, let's see. If I were going to try to count this, I would just say that it's too numerous to count because you don't see all those individual colonies. However, if we took one section, let's just say that um, this plate, let's say that it, and pretend that it did have colonies that just look like uh, you know, separate ones like the ones I'm pointing to, okay? If that were the case, we could then count them and multiply them by a 1,000. So <clears throat> if we uh, saw five, that would be 5,000. If we saw six, 6,000. If we saw 10, that would be 10,000, right? And work our way all the way up to, you know, if you saw 100, that would be 100,000. Now, there are different rules of thumb uh, when you decide whether it's clinically significant or not, and there are some different scenarios. So if, if there were 100, 100 colonies on here and we multiply it and it becomes 100,000, the old rule of thumb is, yes, that would be clinically significant, okay? And especially since it's a GNR and, um, you know, we can look at the patient's urinalysis results and see if there's um, a positive leukocyte esterase and a positive nitrite, and that would say, hey, yes, you have a UTI as well. Um, however, if there were three different bacteria on here and we did see that the two of them ended up just being, you know, a few uh, colonies, whereas the uh, one ended up being very prevalent and ended up being, say, like 100 colonies, even though we know that 
that specimen was not a clean catch. Noting that there is one very prevalent bacteria is and can be clinically significant. So you would then, uh, from here, from that primary setup where we did not have slides, we didn't have a gram stain, I have my students do it in class because of how our learning management system works and how I have the test set up. So that way it gives us all flexibility with uh, what we're doing in class. However, in the real world, you're not going to do a gram stain until you see the the actual auger and the growth after the 24 hour period. So I absolutely would make a smear from here and do a gram stain and see if I'm right, um, which I, I know I am. It's a GNR. And uh, we can then do testing from there to identify what the organism is and then the susceptibility of that organism with the common uh, treatments, the common antibiotics used to treat a patient. You would also want to make sure that there's no drug resistance or, um, you know, watch the drug resistance, uh, on, especially on these GNRs. Okay, so if, again, if we did have a few different colonies, a few different bacterial types, but we had one very prevalent type that looked like this, and then there were just a a little bit of other uh, colonies, we would absolutely say that this is clinically significant. Um, another situation could be if you had um, one colony or a couple of colonies that doesn't reach the 100,000, but if you notice that they're a GNR or um, you're looking at the patient's uh, urinalysis and it does say that there's a leukocytesterase positivity and nitrate positivity. Uh, it could be, uh, it could definitely be a UTI. Patients that have a urinary tract infection do urinate a lot. And so it, it just could be that um, the urine's very dilute because the patient's been urinating a lot and drinking a lot. So um, those are some different scenarios that you can think of. It really depends on your facility's um, procedures and uh, procedures and rules and regulations as to how you should identify uh, the clinical significance of that colony count. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your support, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.